um, language matters. There isn't a template, but the aim is to be specific and clear and to move away from a legalistic or high, highly technical language. Um, I'm also very interested in the ways you've described consent uh, requiring facilitation through the, the various modes on the platform. We'll hear more from Xingxing later, and uh, I'm looking forward to learning more about TogetherNet as a project and, and as a, a practice of translation. Um, so now we're going to move to our next speaker, Chansey Fleet. Welcome, Chansey. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak. This is just such a fabulous community and it's a privilege to be part of it for today. So as was mentioned, I identify as blind. I recently started capitalizing that to kind of make space for the identity because journalists and folks like that will often change it to something else like visually impaired. And I really prefer blind because it speaks not to an absence, but to a specific way of working through the world and moving through the world, which is non-visual, which emphasizes touch and hearing and description and kinesthetic sense and all of, all of those things. And so the techniques that I've learned as a blind person are given to me and passed down to me by my wise community of practice, both those who are currently in the world and the generations who came before. And I'm proud of that. And all of my work starts at that place of, of pride. I'm also a technology educator. I mostly work with communities of disability. And being a library worker, being in New York, and being open to anyone, I work mostly with folks who have lots of intersecting intersectional identities across ability, gender, orientation, ethnicity, level of formal education, level of information literacy. Blindness or disability doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in intersection with all those other things. And so when I look at a tool, whether it's an accessibility tool or not, I look at it through the lens of a person's perceptions, their life circumstances, their wants, their needs, and their knowledges around potential privacy exposures, potential harms or downsides. So I want to approach the proposition and actuality of together not today through an intersectional, intersectional lens. So the central proposition of TogetherNet is the creation of a space where interaction is consentful. Consent uses the Fry's model, which Xing uh, identified, and it's meant to be freely given, reversible, informed, enthusiastic, and specific. The project achieves this by delineating two channels, one which is ephemeral, where messages leave when the last speaker leaves and there's no content stored on a server and one that's archived. And by explaining those channels in a code of consent. In the communities that I serve and probably in the communities that you know, the performance of consent to software's disposition of our identities and data has become reflexive, unquestioned, and coercive. When I say reflexive, when the average user sees the opportunity to accept or decline the terms of service, they know that it's not a fair question. They know that if they decline, they won't be able to use the tool. So they don't read, they just reflexively click through. When I say unquestioned, the average user doesn't read through all that boilerplate text. It's a wall of text, usually using language that only lawyers understand and that not even lawyers read all of. And when I say that it's coercive, the user knows that it's not a real conversation being had about consent. Consent is required to move forward with using a tool. This is particularly true for people who are not steeped in the culture of data privacy and for people of all backgrounds who have an immediate urgent need or want that can only be actuated by consenting. For example, I use a visual interpreter service. The person on the other end of that service can look through my phone's camera 
and explain anything to me. Help me take a photograph. Tell me where the stalls are in a farmer's market. Explain origami instructions or how to put together IKEA furniture. But to avail myself of those affordances, I have to consent that my session, my audio, my video, my metadata might be used at any time for any commercial purpose. Shoshana Zuboff explores this dynamic in her work on surveillance capitalism and finds it to be profoundly asymmetrical. Users almost uniformly consent to terms proposed by software architects, and those terms are crafted to allow those architects to take all kinds of actions and liberties with a user's data that are never revealed or specifically consented to by the user. TogetherNet offers an alternative to this dynamic by embracing the Fry's model of consent. The things the user agrees to are limited and clear. Shing has crafted a code of consent that's prominent and designed to be stepped through at a thoughtful pace. Instead of paragraphs of impe impenetrable text, she offers one thought at a time. She uses plain language, which would be understandable to most readers without a technical background, but offers numerous chances to dig deeper into the technical aspects of web RTC, encryption, and other concepts. Xing use, Xing uses simple uh, metaphors, and pardon me, I just caught my pronoun mistake. I saw the pronoun for the first time today. Zing uses simple metaphors, sitting in a park to convey the nature of an ephemeral conversation and using a bulletin board to convey information that can be seen and shared day after day. These frames invite a visitor to make decisions about security and consent based on the kind of decisions they're already comfortable making in the analog world. Xing has set out to create a space that's inclusive and accessible, and yet in their code of consent, they acknowledge that the alpha version of this tool isn't yet accessible to blind and visually impaired people. In my conversation with Xing, with Xing I asked them some tough questions to find out how an artist who's committed to accessibility and inclusivity finds themselves in the difficult position of having to reckon with this. Xing shared with me that in their computer science education, accessibility was almost never mentioned. As they learned programming languages, they weren't given a functional understanding of how to build accessible software, and no expectation was set that the projects they created for credit should be accessible. They found themselves emerging from formal education with coding skills, but no accessibility skills. Students in computer science enroll because they trust that programs will prepare them with the knowledge and skills essential to their future as creators. Most of these programs, whether situated at a university or as an informal program or boot camp, offer curricula and standards that consider access accessibility non-essential. New developers and designers working in industry or the creative arts find themselves inadvertently prepared for a painful friction with communities of disability like mine who expect equity of access. In building a system that notices and reimagines the dominant patterns of communication and consent online, Xing stumbled into the opportunity to notice and reimagine the dominant patterns that lead to the, the calcification and ex, of accessibility as a difficult surprise and afterthought, a grounds for apology. Xing's particular project also invites us to reconsider who we expect in virtual locations that are spatial in nature. TogetherNet's use of avatars that must come close together to exchange messages surfaces the question, how does a blind person move with confidence in a virtual space? Although folks in our community are generally free to move in the world using our canes, acoustic awareness, and the occasional GPS check, our movement in augmented and virtual realities is much more constrained. The designers and developers of AR and VR from the very simple to the fully immersive are products of an inherited culture that doesn't consider the movement of blind people in, in digital spaces. Shing is committed to making together not fully accessible, even though the tools they are using don't readily afford guidance about how to make that happen. They're engaging with the community of blind and visually impaired people to explore how we can traverse and perceive virtual space. Can we do it with arrow keys, a touchscreen canvas, something else? Should the presence of other people, the arrival of messages, the distance between groups be rendered by simple text, a spatialized map that includes directional sound, some combination of the two? 
Shing responds to the challenge of accessibility with an inquiring spirit, a determination to create a space where everyone's welcome, and a genuine desire to learn from the wisdom of the blind community and our allies. They're engaging with the creators of P5JS modules that use sound to make plat that platform more access accessible. And they're building relationships with experts who can help them test and iterate accessibility. Like consent, accessibility takes maintenance and care. It's a continuing practice in which we can all renegotiate and grow. And it requires enthusiasm and specificity. Shing is committed to this next adventure and I can't wait to see what kind of accessible space they create. Thank you.